when they selected me, they selected me knowing I'd be the first one to go. Mm. I walked into one of the rooms and said something about, you know, you're going to pick me. What you don't know is I'm going to win. And what you need to know for planning purposes is I'm going to host next year's show. And, uh, <laughs> and they were all like laughing because I was so stupidly cocky. Minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. It's one small step. One eyewitness. One major pop cultural event. You had to be there, uncover stories that shed light on our most iconic moments. Like the real enemy. Each week, a different host takes on the task of finding and interviewing one person within 48 hours who was there with no idea what their event will be. Come join the ride. You believe in miracles? Yes! Hey, it's Webb from High Bar. Hey, Webb. You ready for your assignment? Yes, sir. What you got? Hey, I'm Brandon Sneed. I'm an author and journalist. I've written half a dozen books and tons of in-depth stories for Rolling Stone, Sports Illustrated, The New York Times, ESPN, the list goes on. I've written about a lot of really incredible people in the world. Mostly these stories are about athletes. I've done some other stuff, but that's really been the main focus the last several years. And so when Webb was asking me about doing an episode of You Had to Be There, I said, hell yeah, man, just let me do something outside of sports. So your assignment for this week's episode of You Had to Be There is to find an eyewitness who is at the final tribal council for the first season of the hit show Survivor in 2000. Oh, wow. Starting now, you have 48 hours to find someone, whether they were in the jury, production, contestants, Jeff Probst, does it matter? I was 13 when Survivor debuted on CBS. And after talking to Webb, I realized I couldn't remember much about it. So I did some homework. This was a fun rabbit hole to go down. There's the nostalgia factor, the lower budget production value, and lo-fi digital cameras. This was life before streaming when you watched what was on TV. And now we have like thousands of reality TV shows to pick from, but back then, this was pretty much it. Survivor's first episode aired on CBS on May 31st, 2000. Audiences had no idea what to expect, but the show quickly became a cultural phenomenon. America had never seen anything like it. More than 50 million people tuned in for the finale. Culture writer Allison Herman said, You can't talk about America without talking about television. You can't talk about television without talking about reality TV. And you can't talk about reality TV without talking about Survivor. This is an excerpt from The Daily Show in 2000 when the first season of Survivor was on the air sweeping the nation. Reality-based programming is changing the face of entertainment. Tonight's question, reality-based TV, does America really need more? Yes. No. Yes. This latest wave of reality programming has taken America by storm. Bring on the castaways eating raw rat. Place a fragile elderly woman in mortal danger. The idea was as extreme as it was simple. The ultimate social experiment. Here is Jeff Probst. 16 strangers forced to band together, carve out a new existence, totally accountable for their actions. They must learn to adapt or they're voted off. Eliminations would occur at regular gatherings called tribal councils, usually late at night in the dark, requiring a hike through the jungle with nothing but torches. All very dramatic. In the end, only one will remain and will leave the island with $1 million in cash as their reward. Final episode featured four contestants, 22-year-old whitewater rafting guide Kelly Wilkelsworth, a 38-year-old truck driver named Sue Hawk, 72-year-old retired Navy SEAL Rudy Bosch, and 39-year-old corporate consultant named Richard Hatch. Two of them, Sue Hawk and Rudy Bosch, would be eliminated early in the episode. Upon her elimination, Sue Hawk delivered a screed of a speech that was borderline unhinged becoming one of the most iconic scenes in reality television history. Clips of it appeared on all the late night shows and ran on repeat on MTV and VH1. Basically, it went viral before viral was a thing. Sue Hawk. Rich, you are a very openly arrogant, pompous human being. But I admire your frankness with it. You have worked hard to get where you're at, and you started working hard way before you come to the island. So with my work ethic background, I give that credit to you. 
But on the other hand, your inability to admit your failures without going into a whiny speech makes you a bit of a loser in life. This island is pretty much full of only two things, snakes and rats. And in the end of Mother Nature, we have Richard the Snake, who knowingly went after prey, and Kelly, who turned into the rat that ran around like the rats do on this island, trying to run from the snake. I feel we owe it to the island's spirits that we have learned to come to know, to let it be in the end the way Mother Nature intended it to be, for the snake to eat the rat. I sent out texts and made some calls to a bunch of my contacts in the media world. Writers, editors, producers, publicists, telling them what I was working on and asking if they knew anybody, anybody, who had been at that final tribal council. After finding winner Richard Hatch's Instagram, I sent him a DM on a whim. Nobody, nobody, not a single one of my contacts could help me. And then I woke up from a nap to see a missed call from an area code I didn't recognize and a new DM on Instagram from Richard Hatch himself. Called you, Brandon. It took me two hours to find my guy. Mission complete. The name, like, endures, you know? I think that it's uh, one of those things where you walk onto an island for a show that does not exist and has no, like, historical significance or even context. And then, like, 39 days later, you're playing for a million dollars. And then, I mean, then you're world famous. (laughs) I mean, it's... Kind of surreal, actually, if you think about it. I'm so fascinated by the beginnings of things before they have like any kind of understanding, I guess, of what will be cultural significance or like importance or how big they get. Yeah, you're right. This is the first time this has ever been done. They have no idea it's going to be as big as it gets. Don't you get a gold star? I mean, honestly, yeah, man. I I appreciate it. You're making me look pretty damn good right now. (laughs) Funny. Can you tell me, I mean, just kind of start from the beginning, because how do you find out about this back then? My mom, I guess, was first who called and said, hey, they're putting together a show just for you. (laughs) And I'm thinking, what the hell are you talking about? I literally, you know, she always came up with cockamamie ideas of, you know, what I could do and what's this and what's that. And yeah, what were you doing at the time for work and where were you living? I had my own company. I was a corporate trainer 20 years or so. I'd been in the army. I was a massive hiker and camper. I I spent a month in the Talkeetna Mountains north of Anchorage uh, in Alaska. I spent a month in Canadian woods. I spent a month in Maine hiking the Appalachian, et cetera, climbing Mount Katahdin, canoeing the West Penobscot. So this was something I would pay to go on. I would love it. But my background in academics is also psychology. You know, I have a master's in education and counseling, uh, bachelor's in applied behavioral sciences, I'm a course away from PhD in humanities. People, who are we? That's kind of always been my thing. About a week and a half later, my friend from D.C. called and said, hey, CBS is putting together a show just for you. I'm like, what the hell's going on? How did they hear about it? My mom saw an ad and then Kathleen saw the ad and knew it was CBS. So she pointed me to CBS and looked it up and saw the application and 18 page questionnaire. And I figured, okay, well, the thousands of people will be sending it in. So I made each one of them interesting. Who would you not want to be on the island with? I put morons and bigots and bores. Oh my. Just to keep them reading and uh, had to send in a three minute video. And I hired a guy here who was a producer and he helped me get little snippets of my life onto tape. You know, I was doing push-ups and my kid was yelling, hey, dad, do more push-ups. We need the money. <laughs> I walked by the stove in a restaurant and picked up a raw steak and started chewing on it. You know, that kind of thing. And I just mailed the thing in, you know, and then that started a process of calls. And so the first call was just, you know, talking to somebody. I don't know who it was, probably uh, one of the producers. And then they said, hey, OK, I think we're going to talk to you. And so they had me go up to Boston for the next conversation, which was an in-person interview. And then that got winnowed down to like 50 of us got flown to LA and put in a hotel for a couple of weeks. 
and then that got narrowed down to the final people. Were there any other kind of tests or what was that process? Oh God. Yeah. The, the two weeks in the sequestered in a hotel, not talking to anybody, that was all kinds of weird stuff. I mean, doctors and um, psychological exams. And one time they had a room, you know, with nothing in it, but a camera and they just put you in and closed the door and said, we'll be back in whatever it was, 40 minutes or something. And, you know, they just filmed you to see what the hell you would do when you were doing nothing. I'm like, I got naked and, you know, laughed at the camera or whatever the hell I did. There were two things that were so crazy and important. I knew that there was a game I had to play to get on the show that was different from the game I had to play once I was on. I knew that. I knew producers had to be convinced, somebody, these decision makers. So like one of the cameramen for the interviews kept saying this stupid thing, like, so if you win, what are you gonna do with the money? I said, listen, dude, I'm not answering your stupid questions anymore until you pay attention to me and ask them accurately. I told you I'm gonna win. so." Stop saying if I win and ask me when I win, what's the deal? And he was like, what an ass. <laughs> I knew these people were going to have to select somebody that would be interesting, that people would want to watch. So that was a gimmick. I was playing them to get on to be able to play people. The problem was I was so believable that Mark Burnett, who was writing his book in real time and everyone else was referring to me as arrogant and overconfident, which isn't true since I won. <laughs> so I tried to think about the game and how I could try and figure out what I might need to do to win the game. But after being selected, we had a very, very short window. Just before that final selection process, I went to Gay Ski Week in Aspen and I broke my arm. So I took off the cast to go to this final interview and just pretended I didn't have a broken arm. <laughs> so your arm's broken in a cast for like a week and you're like, well, I can't have them knowing I got a broken arm. So you just saw it off yourself? Yes. Oh, yes. Like what, like, what a little hacksaw at your house? How did you get your own cast off? No, no, a knife with a, a steak knife or something. Uh, How big of a cast was it? Just below my elbow to my hand. Uh, before I got on the plane to head to... California, my buddies and I took it off and washed my arm and, and everything and made sure that I didn't have to scream in order to hold it because I didn't want anybody to see me getting off the plane with a cast and ask about it. So I just needed it to heal. And it did, thankfully, but they didn't know even during the physical, they didn't somehow do anything that made me, you know, scream about my broken arm or anything. Mark Burnett told me when we were in that interview period of his selecting participants, that he had a gay couple who were close friends of his, and he wanted the world to see gays in a different way. Burnett particularly understood what he was doing by bringing me on as an openly gay person. Finally, it was go time. Once I saw folks in Malaysia, because we flew on the same plane, but we didn't know who was who, and you know, we weren't allowed to speak to one another, that kind of thing. And then on the boat over to the island is the first time we were told, okay, you can talk a few, two, three minutes before they threw us over the, over the side of the boat. So you're just getting kicked off this boat onto the island. Like, what have you been told to expect as far as what's going to be available to you? I mean, not just food wise and, and water wise, but like if somebody needs medical attention or something like that, what have they told you versus what was shown to us? So they pretty much told us nothing about those kinds of details. So you really knew next to nothing then? Very, very little. They gave us an overall kind of idea that there would be challenges and there would be a tribal council during which someone would leave and they didn't tell us the specific dynamics so that they could film us and see our reactions as we started to learn these different things yeah they wanted it to be a surprise for y'all as much as the audience then i think so yeah production value rich was a thinker from the start first he's the guy who created the concept of an alliance I found this YouTube video on the channel Once Upon an Island, where they're discussing the evolution of survivor alliances. So the um, alliances have begun, and I didn't even have to do much about it. Because the more people you know that are going to vote for somebody else, you might as well go with that. You might as well 
you know, keep yourself safe. We really could control our fate if we stick together. It was, you know, a game in which I was going to have to align with other people. That's what I'd figured out. They didn't tell us that. So I knew I was going to have to figure out who these people that I haven't met yet are and not get on the bad side of enough of them for them to get rid of me. Right. So I thought, who am I going to make an alliance with? You know, and that started for me before we were even kicked off the boat. Once I saw folks in Malaysia, because we flew on the same plane, but we didn't know who was who, and, you know, we weren't allowed to speak to one another, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then on the boat over to the island is the first time we were told, okay, you can talk just two, three minutes before they threw us over the side of the boat. And during those minutes, I picked out who, like Rudy, I knew I wanted to align with him. I could tell he was military. And what seems to be the very first alliance in reality television history, Rich and Rudy did more than simply team up to win. Going back to Burnett's reasoning for casting Rich as an openly gay man teaming up with a very straight and straight-edged military man in Rudy, they showed America a French that the likes of which was rare and borderline scandalous at the time. Here's Rudy on Survivor Season 1. The homosexual, he's one of the nicest guys I ever met, and he's good at what he does. But anyway, uh, me and Richard got to be pretty good friends. Not in a homosexual way, that's for sure. I don't know what my buddies are going to say when I get home, but uh, I'll have to deal with that. The relationship between Rudy and I and how it impacted America, literally. I don't know if you're aware, but... No, I'm actually not really, because I was fairly young. I'm 36 now. Rudy was a Navy SEAL, a a straight 72-year Navy SEAL. I'm a gay outspoken, naked, you know, atheist. And the dynamic between us who formed an alliance and him saying things like, he's fat and he's queer, but he's smart. And I love him, not in a homosexual way. I mean, people made t-shirts out of this, articles everywhere about me and Rudy. And it changed the way people looked at gay people. It was a watershed moment for much of America as to how we're human. And this idea of forming alliances, am I right in that? You were the first one to do it? No, no, you're right. This was something I thought of on the way over. I needed to figure out who I could align myself with and create an alliance that would last throughout whatever they were going to throw at us. This is part of my planning. This was the first unscripted drama other than MTV, which wasn't on a major network. So this is the first show on any major network to be in this reality genre. Was that anything the producers discussed with you all prior? Like, no. if you're on the show, will you form an alliance? It was just an idea that you had Correct. going into it. The truth is, I don't think they knew any of what we would do. <laughs> I mean, that's why I was wondering if they were as caught off guard by this idea of alliances, because now it's just like a reality television staple. Brandon, they were caught off guard by everything, literally everything. I mean, my being naked, they didn't know what to do. Ah, yes, the nudity. Rich quickly deployed one of the most unusual strategies from his interview process in the world of the game. He decided to get naked, like, all the time. Here are fellow contestants, Sean and Colleen. You never get used to seeing Richard naked. I'm 39 today, and I had intended for quite a long time to celebrate my birthday naked. Rich wanted to be naked for his birthday. Oh, fun. (laughs) Show off a little more. I mean, he was doing it for shock value. It's goofy. Who walks around naked 24-7? It made sense, first of all. It was 110 degrees, and all the other guys got crotch rot. I'm the only one who didn't. Producers and otherwise, they're walking around day after day in these soaking wet shorts in 110 degree weather. So that just made sense to me. And I didn't care. You know, I've been camping all my life and everybody else was naked at different times. So it wasn't as horribly odd a thing as you might think. It became odd, like how often maybe I was naked and that while they were filming, I was still naked at times. I'd made that decision. But it also helped my game. You know, I got to not be followed by cameras because they had no interest in my being naked. So I was able to sneak up and listen to conversations where I wouldn't have been able were cameras following me. So that kind of thing helped. Yeah. 
it was just a whole litany of reasons that made sense. I was naked from the day we, we landed on the beach. <laughs> you know, I'm spearfishing most of the time. I'm in the water. I'm, it's raining. I thought, okay, this is CBS. They're not going to show me naked. So they're going to blur it. That's not a problem. I thought it'll be interesting for people who are watching the show to ask themselves, what's this big deal? Why are we such prudes in America? Everybody's naked. Right. I had no idea they would make it my branding. I was the only one who kind of hung out and wandered around naked, just kind of lived that way often. But everybody got naked, sometimes just to hang out and dry out, sometimes to go in the ocean and wash off. And I thought it just makes sense. Nobody should care. Did it feel immersive and tense and meaningful? Or were there points where you're like, what are we doing here? Because nobody's ever done this before. Nobody done it. No, and they hadn't done it. And even if they had been practicing or trying to, they had no idea what we as participants were going to do. But they'd structured it in the unnecessary ways. For example, going to tribal council and having to hike what? I don't know, a mile or for or more back up and down ravines. Rudy behind me with his torch tripped and knocked the torch over onto me down my back, which was up and flames or sitting in tribal council in the rain for ages, just shivering, you know, they had to figure all this out, how to get it done. And we were exhausted and had no food and, and stressed. The game itself was exhausting because these aren't your family or your friends and you're having to consider and focus what's happening and what's the goal and if you don't you're a puddle you're crying you're hugging each other you're you know my best friend i just met you three days ago but most of the time it was just a full-on game for me i tried to stay focused the whole time as it turned out, the way Rich remembers it, one of his greatest obstacles in reaching that fateful final tribal council was the show's host, Jeff Probst himself. But at tribal council, Jeff still hadn't figured out his role. So he would ask awful questions that reflected his having watched the dailies. So he knew stuff that the other participants shouldn't have known, and he would screw it up by asking. And Right from the outset, I learned to answer his questions with blatant lies before I could get him aside and say, knock it off. You're screwing this up. Remember, we're each interviewed by producers throughout the day. So Jeff would see that footage. And if I told the producer what I was going to do or how I was going to approach this, Jeff shouldn't ask me about that because it's nothing I've told any of the other participants. It's me knowing that these interviews would help viewers and I wanted to engage with them. I'm going to talk to the viewers and then I'm going to go do it. Outright lying is absolutely essential, especially when you have a host like Jeff, who's as bold as to ask, well, so Sue, tell me, is there an alliance? What a question. The last Island Tribal Council, when I was talking about I'll be staying around here because I'm providing fish was an outright blatant lie. Catching fish makes people happy, but that's not why they're voting me here. They're not voting me off because I am not letting them. In those interviews with producers, I would argue and tell Jeff to stop ruining the game. <laughs> the experience of getting from day one, getting dropped off the boat to day 40, the final tribal council, was a constant back and forth between tediousness and chaos. For instance, Richard's constant nudity drove some producers into hysterics. At some point, one of the producers started yelling at me, you're not going to get any freaking airtime. Put some damn clothes on. You know, and that happened a few times in the game with them screaming at me for being naked. You, you know, you're not going to get enough airtime. You're making it tough for us to film. You know, this is just a cameraman and producer who was just tired of not knowing what he was going to make of it or that it would become iconic and that the choice was something that would end up being my branding. None of them thought about any of this stuff. They were too busy with the details. I mean, what did you have to eat? There was some rice, but it was one can each team took when we jumped off the boat. It was very limited, and we had to portion it out so that we got barely a bowl most days. And there really wasn't anything else. People talk about coconuts and stuff like that, but there were just so few that were ripe or that you could eat. Fish, when I got it, 
helped, but it wasn't like I could get lots of fish. You know, we had a fish trap. I was the only one getting fish, period. Nobody could help me, even though I tried to teach them. And I tried to teach Greg and I tried to teach Sue Hawk. And, you know, she got stung by a thing ray a couple of times and her hand blew up. And I'd been doing it all my life. I grew up here. My dad was a lobsterman in Newport, Rhode Island. And so I was in the ocean. I was spearfishing from a young age. So I had a sense of how fish lived, where they were, and how to, to stalk them, that kind of thing. And I couldn't teach it to other people. But they were desperate and they wanted food. Were you prepared for that going into it? The food deprivation, the malnutrition and all that? Did you know that was going to be part of it? We were told they weren't going to feed us. But I don't think anybody could prepare for the toll it takes on your body. And I think that's part of the game. That's one of the biggest pieces people don't realize about early seasons. It was so physically draining and exhausting. It's hard to describe how much it really affected your brain and your body with no food. From the sound of things, the producers and cameramen were struggling just as much as the contestants. Although they'd work on the island in shifts, they were still out there in the elements without much food themselves for days on end at times. They presumably had a camp of some sort to return to, but in many ways they were just as isolated as the contestants and facing many of the same challenges in terms of dealing with the weather, the heat, the lack of adequate hydration and nutrition. And again, with this being the first time anyone had ever done this, generally having very little clue what was going on. Where are they throughout this too? Where are they staying and sleeping? What are they eating? I mean, they were in tents in the rain and talked to me occasionally about how bad it was. And like they had a, a Malaysian couple who was making like fish head soup for them sometimes. In fact, I ended up feeding some of them. They were struggling. They were just always there. There was always a camera. You know, I'd be laying in the sand sleeping and there'd be a camera in my face. You learned not to think about their even being there. You couldn't. If you were focused enough on the game, you didn't have room to think about what they're doing or how long they're there or any of that. Rich also says that before the events shown in the final episode, exacerbating the physical and psychological dysfunction that came with their malnutrition was the fact that he caught producers secretly feeding Kelly, his eventual rival in the final tribal council. When there were five of us left, and you may have heard, I caught them cheating. And I shut down production, had it all out with them. They'd been feeding Kelly through the whole game, and she'd been sharing her food with Sue. Did they air that stuff about the shutting down production and they were feeding Kelly? Oh, no, no, no. Nobody knew about it for years. Most people don't know about it now. It was horrible. I was laying by the fire, and uh, I think they thought I was asleep, and one of them came over, I won't even say who, and handed Kelly some food. And I saw it. Here she is with a chocolate bar. And so I didn't know what to do. And I followed her and found other food that she'd had, peanut butter, etc. So finally, I called one of the main producers over and I said, listen, I'm not filming. We're stopping until this is addressed. So then Burnett and Craig Poligian, he was also the executive producer of the first three seasons of Survivor. They both came out and that's when the drama started. They were playing like good cop, bad cop. Burnett was screaming like, what do you think you're doing? Who do you think you are? You're ruining my life's work. And I'm furious. And so I'm giving it back to him. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? I'm not ruining it. I'm trying to play the game. And then Craig is playing good cop. So he walks away toward the edge of the forest and he has each of us come to him one-on-one. -on -one and then he's trying to talk us down. So that good cop, bad cop thing continued until I showed Mark a letter that Kelly had written to Sue and Sue had given to me, in which Kelly wrote saying, you know, I'd fed you the whole time. I'd shared all the food I'd gotten with you. And, and I had created this animosity between Sue and Kelly and fueled that fire intentionally. Sue thought Kelly was screwing her so Sue gave me that letter to prove to Mark that I knew they'd been feeding her the whole time. As soon as Mark saw that I'd had proof, he stopped the bad cop thing where he was blaming it on me and then shifted to, 
you know we're in this for life, right? You know you and I are family now. So imagine this, with five of us left, <laughs> you know, this is the end of the game. This is drama on top of drama, on top of the game, on top of, I mean, it was crazy. Crazy. By episode 13, the season finale, Richard was in the final four along with Kelly Wigglesworth, Sue Hawk, and his pal Rudy. An excerpt from a televised ad of Survivor. It began with 16 survivors. Let's do it! It became a national phenomenon. And the number one show in America. This Wednesday, it all comes down to one final vote and one incredible night of TV. The Survivor finale is so amazing, so top secret, we can't show you a single second. Who will be the ultimate survivor? Find out on the two-hour finale. Some 50-plus million viewers tuned in to watch, and Nielsen later reported that 125 million people watched at least some part of the finale. I mean, while you're out there for 40 days, what are you thinking? Is it just, oh, we'll have fun with the game, and who knows if anybody's even going to watch this? So here's this cocky, arrogant ego thing of mine that people keep talking about. Yeah, you know, (laughs) yeah. I thought this is gold. This is something we don't have on TV. This is something people will be fascinated to watch. I knew it would connect with people. And I told producers, et cetera, this is going to be huge. (laughs) During the final immunity challenge, Hatch made the strategic move of removing his hand from the pole. He simply gave up. Apparently, this sent Jeff Probst into a full-blown meltdown. I mean, Probst lost his shit, lost his mind at the final challenge when I took my hand off the pole. Yeah, walk us through that again. It's a final challenge where the three of us, Rudy, Kelly, and I had to hold on to a pole while we were standing on uh, these little tree stumps. And um, whoever's hand came off the pole was going to be out. And the final person who had their hand on the pole got to choose which of the two of us who were out they took to tribal council and it would be the final two so i was on there you know holding my hand on the pole thinking god damn it kelly who was a river rafting guide 22 years old would probably still be holding on to the pole now 23 years later if nobody let go rudy's 72 he's not going to be able to stay on forever So I had an alliance with Rudy that was strong. And I knew that if he were the last one standing, he would take me to the end. And then I had to think through Kelly. And Kelly didn't have a chance against Rudy, who was just your crotchety old grandfather that people would have voted for just because he made it to the end. And he made it to the end because I brought him there. (laughs) And against Kelly, they would have voted for Rudy. So I knew that the only chance she had was to take me to the end, hoping that she'd have enough votes against me to make her the winner. And so eventually, when I figured that out and was confident about it, I kept second-guessing myself, thinking, am I just too hot? Is the sun burned my brain? Is this self-sabotage? Am I screwing up my chance to win this million? Which I think is like an amazing, iconic move now. This made Probst lose his shit. He wasn't there. He came running over, screaming, what do you think you're doing? What the fuck? You're ruining the game. You know, you know not realizing we're playing a game. We're going to do what we need to do to win the game. This is just something they couldn't have contemplated that I would think this through. And he thought I was just giving up I actually just pulled up a clip from it looking at it and it's showing him having this very calm conversation with you about your decision were you surprised to see kelly change your vote it's about what's in your best interest we all four joined an alliance okay then sue and kelly joined a sub alliance against you guys yeah okay to, get to the top sue and i had formed an alliance he brought out oranges and orange juice once he calmed down you know they had to film all that because right. that's the part that made it yeah <laughs> yeah how did it go from him losing his shit to this calm like conversation he's having with you over oranges yeah remember this takes place over hours <laughs> the producers, the cameraman, you see people literally grabbing him and trying to talk him down. And 
obviously they had to play and now what do we do now that he's done this but meanwhile they're not supposed to be affecting us or me and viewers don't realize how much we had to deal with to stay in the game that we were trying to play ourselves and anyway i took my hand off the pole and then i explained to each of them i knew it was in their best interest to take me and i was right when rudy's hand came off the pole and then kelly had to choose she took me to the end one of the best decisions i've ever made that was one of the hardest things to think through everything had to be thought out and considered in real time as it's happening and the stress of that is hard to communicate so the exhaustion was real the brain fog the depletion from not eating you know i lost 42 pounds in 39 days that's more than a pound a day yeah to bring us to this final tribal council i mean as you're waiting for this final challenge to end are you nervous it was a closed set so there was nobody around but just one camera operator and whatever because they didn't want everybody to know necessarily who won and so the the normal amount of people who were there filming and doing sound and watching you know sometimes there would be a hundred people there at some of the challenges they invited press and but this one this final tribal council was quiet <laughs> nobody around nobody on the sidelines nothing it was interesting there's no telling how long tribal councils go you know your ass is falling asleep on these stupid logs and it's nothing like what you see because particularly in the early show where they didn't have these amazing sets with cameras everywhere you know this is set up a new shot move over here get ready for another thought the director has jeff would ask a few things and this is tedious in the midst of no food no water no shelter raining so people did you know break down people would get you know angry and frustrated and sad and cry and you know it was nutty yeah i can imagine i mean you know the iconic speech sue gave that everybody <laughs> still remembers it wasn't as shocking to us as you might think because this is kind of sue sue did odd things like that it had been obvious that sue wasn't very stable i was thinking cbs should have known this and i don't know that others were were really aware of just how traumatized sue was but i was i saw how she was affected during the game so it wasn't that much of a shock however that said during tribal council while she's doing this i'm thinking holy crap shut up she was trying to convince the other participants to vote for me but she was doing it so mean-spiritedly she was saying such awful things that i knew she would have the opposite effect and it did it convinced Colleen to change her vote and vote against me. <laughs> there wasn't anything I could do. Nobody knew how tribal council was going to unfold or what was going to happen or that any of this was even going to take place. So all we could do was just, you know, like you're riding a bull, just hang on and do the best you can. Yeah, that final just waiting. What are you thinking and what's going on inside of you? By the time I'd actually made it to the final tribal council, I was sitting there and didn't know how the votes were going to go i was as emotionally depleted as i'd ever been just through the ringer wondering this this exciting game that i'd been through and how was it going to play out and were the producers behind the scenes actually orchestrating what they wanted to happen or was this going to be a genuine game and an opportunity for me to win a million dollars what's the deal so there was a lot going on and I think you can even see it in my face in what made air when the final card was turned over and it was rich. The winner of the first survivor competition is Rich. Congratulations, Rich. Everything in my body kind of just let go and like I did it. Wow. Whew. Overwhelming. Overwhelming. Yeah. Powerful card was turned over i i feel like you know the wizard of oz you know whatever the, the melting everything let go I, I didn't know what to do it's just what's left in you there's no describing it from there what was the process they escorted us 
me and Kelly, I guess that was it, down out of tribal council and down just a bit to, boom, this what they called rap party. And oh my God, there's everyone, crew, people, everything. And this whole setup for this huge party with food and booze and music. And I remember grabbing like these couple of white burgerish things. I don't even know what they were made out of. <laughs> I think it might have been ground pork or something. I don't know, but it was white. And um, there were a couple of them. They were meat. That's all I knew. And they were good. And so I took a couple of those off the table and I was eating them. And I wandered through, and I think the, I forget the guy's name. He was the psychologist or whatever. And I just said, hey, uh, I want to shower. <laughs> so he took me back to his cabin and there was a shower. And I just remember the black water pouring off me just continuously as I was trying to wash myself clean. And I walked back for a few minutes or whatever to see what was going on, watching Rudy was drunk and he was being bawdy and he was hysterical. But, you know, I mean, dirty talking and I was laughing at that and somebody was playing music. Finally, I just was like, where can I sleep? And that guy let me sleep in his cabin and I went to sleep and I woke up just before sunrise. The sun was coming up and I walked out and there were people still drinking and others passed out all over this place under trees and I wandered over toward a boat where there was a driver to take us back to the mainland, which was pretty far. I hopped on the boat. It was just me and him. And I headed back to the mainland. And I remember the sun coming up, me thinking I had a million bucks. I don't know if I'll ever experience a feeling like that of happiness and peace and, you know, what's life going to be kind of just possibilities crossing the South China Sea, going on my way back to Borneo. And it was powerful for me emotionally. It was an awesome morning. I felt as good as I've ever felt in my life, maybe because I'd finally slept. It was the first night inside in over a month, in 40 days, first bed, first shower, first food. So rested, hopping on this boat. I don't think I was overwhelmed emotionally other than just letting myself feel what was really just joy. I remember calling when I got back to the hotel, my sister, and and not telling her I'd won and saying something to the effect of, oh, you're going to love it. You're going to have to watch. Upon returning home, Hatch knew his life would change forever. The way he tells it, though, how his life changed, how things have gone the past 20 years, has been, to put it bluntly, pretty shitty. He talks a lot of it up to the way he was portrayed on the show, saying that people really believed he was some sort of Machiavellian character. And he says that a lot of people are still pretty homophobic on top of that. As soon as he got home, for instance, he ran into some legal trouble involving his adopted son, a special needs child who claimed Rich abused him. Rich was clear to those charges, but that was only the start because then the show began to air. You're watching it and seeing it become this phenomenon but not really being able to talk about it and what was that like so that was exciting to me because i cared about the people in my life who were watching it and i cared enough to not tell them so i wanted them to experience the fun and the pleasure and the and the game of it with me so i had everybody over to my house for each weekly showing the requirement was they had to be quiet during the show and they wanted to watch it with me. I wasn't going to tell them how it unfolded. So I, I made the best of it. I just was watching it with them, enjoying was it. Was there anything that you were surprised didn't air or anything that you thought was a critical moment that ended up not being relevant at all in the show? Well, first I'll say I was impressed with how accurately the story was portrayed. I'm a realist, and I knew they had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of footage because they had multiple cameras, and somehow they had to make this make sense. And not only did they make it make sense, it was accurate. It portrayed what was unfolding better than I could have ever imagined they would be capable of doing. As the show became a cultural phenomenon, Hatch saw his life turn into a funhouse mirror version of itself. 
I'm dealing with the press. Us Weekly's reporter came to the house. You know, he went for a jog with me and then we took off our clothes and jumped in the pool and we were swimming. And that's how he wrote the article. This was fun for me. Meanwhile, the press who are all losing their minds. I had people drunk coming into my house at two in the morning after the bar. They'd watch Survivor and they're like, we're at the Survivor's house. It was as nutty as you can imagine. Right after the winning episode aired and I was flown to Australia, I got out of the airport to something like you might think Michael Jackson would see, just like throngs of people. I mean, they it was bad here. It was even worse in Australia. People were just enthralled by the show and by who I was and wanted to see me and get my autograph. And it was a weird, weird, weird time. And at what point in all this do you get the money? So I got the check. It was after the winning episode aired, uh, maybe on a morning show, and they gave me the check, and then cameras from the news crews followed me to my local bank and filmed me depositing the check, and the, the teller, it was her first day working at the bank, <laughs> and I was depositing my million plus. Knowing what you know now, would you do the show again? Well... What a silly question, right? Because knowing what I know now <laughs> isn't knowing what I knew then. I had a really good life, and this show shifted things in a way that no one could ever have predicted. And it literally destroyed me and my family. From here, my interview with Richard evolved from talking about his specific moment in Survivor into a long, fascinating conversation regarding various trials and tribulations he faced as a result of his sudden windfall of cash and influx of fame. This included prison time for tax evasion, threats and hate mail, false allegations of domestic abuse. People would go as far as stalking him and appearing on his private property. For the purposes of this episode, I need to wrap things up here, but it's worth noting here that life as a reality TV star turns out to be a lot harder and more painful than it probably seems. Or at least it was for Richard Hatch. I decided to call Julia, the producer, to tell her how things went. What did you think of him? Like, what was his vibe? I mean, I see a lot of people really don't like him, but I don't know. I just, I enjoy talking to him. I think he feels really misunderstood a lot and um, you kind of feel for the guy. I mean, I guess in one way it's like, yeah, he chose to go on this show and had an idea that would make him pretty famous. But on the other hand, it just sounds like that just complicated his life in a million ways after the fact. And at the same time, he loved playing this game. Yeah, I wonder, yeah. did he have any idea like how famous he was going to become? No, I don't think so. I don't think anybody could have ever really expected to become this famous off of a game show on an island like that. He certainly didn't expect the fuckery that occurred in his life afterwards as a result. After he became a reality star, did he just become like super rich? Long story short, no. I mean, yeah, he, he won a million bucks, but of course you lose half of that in taxes. And then like, you know, he ran into all these problems with tax evasion and he's got this um, story where supposedly the producers for Survivor were supposed to pay it and they didn't. And that's what led to all of the problems he's had with the government over this money over the years. I mean, he did years in prison <laughs> over not paying these taxes and whatever happened with the money, like it just sounds... Like it was a hot mess. I kind of think of reality TV stars as actors. They're yeah, like right. amateur actors. And I think that's why people like Mike White are so into reality TV, because it does really show you something about human psychology. But at the same time, it's so exploitative. Even if it's all part of the game, I just hate the idea of like, feel like I'm fucking somebody over. I just can't. It makes me a bad journalist sometimes because I learn stuff about people that, you know, would probably help me out to publish, but then it's like upsetting for them. It's kind of the same feeling. <laughs> it's like, I can't. Well, that makes me think you're a very sweet and deep person. So I appreciate it. Nowadays, everybody knows like it's a game and you're trying to fuck people over. So if like we're all trying to fuck each other over, is anybody really getting fucked over? That's the question. It's Feel like, what do reality. I want to raise my kids believing? And it's not that like, well, everybody's going to screw you over. So you got to screw them over first. I don't want to live that. <laughs> you just have to tell your kids definitely not to be on reality TV. Yeah, that's pretty much it. One part of that like conversation we had as we were wrapping up, he did seem really struck by like me actually giving a shit about what he had to say. I think 
I mean, I believed a lot of what he said. Maybe he just, uh, you know, tricked me somehow. I don't know. But like, he seemed pretty sincere. I mean, he's a reality TV and cultural <laughs> icon. Still a huge part of pop culture today, this show. And he was like the first one to win it. Anything else that you would like to add for the purposes of this show? You young and you, you consummate reporter. Is there anything I didn't ask you that I should have? Hey man, it's a fair question, right? <laughs> it's been 23 years and I love the game and I do like talking about it. And I love interacting with people who for the first time encounter me and want to know my thoughts. And I'm sincerely touched by what seems like your sincerity. It's awesome. So thank you, Brandon. I appreciate it very, very much. Brandon, the child spoke. You Had to Be There is a High Bar production, created by High Bar. Today's episode, Survivor, Borneo Finale, was written and hosted by Brandon Sneed. Produced by Julia Thompson and Webb Barr. Story produced by Julia Thompson. Associate producer, Teeny Lieberson. Edit, sound mix, and engineering by Teeny Lieberson. Original score by Teeny Lieberson. Artwork created by Dylan Lathrop. Special thanks to our parents, friends, and chosen family. And most importantly, thank you to the artists who have inspired us. Because they had to do it.